I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. First, let me thank ASI to give me the opportunity to access this platform to share with you technical aspects of the analysis of single cells by application of fluorescent insight hybridization technologies, as well as the results that we have accumulated over the past 10 years by application of such technologies to the analysis of the cancer genome and the aging genome. My name is Cristina Montagna. I am Associate Professor of Genetics and Pathology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where, as I said, I run a basic science laboratory to study uh, the genome of cancer cells and aging cells, as well as I am the founder and the supervisor of the Molecular Cytogenetic Core. Our institution, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, is located in the Bronx, in the New York area, and this is the beautiful building, the Price Building, from which we operate from. Both my laboratory and the core facility are located in this building on the same floor. We are on the fourth floor. And the Molecular Cytogenetics Core is a shared resource that provides access to tools for the preparation of human and marine samples suitable for molecular genetics and cytogenetic analysis of the entire genome. The services that are provided by the core can broadly divided into three different areas. We have uh, protocols and methods for sample and tissue processing. Those go from establishment of EBV transformed cell lines, uh, processing of peripheral blood with the separation of various cell subtypes that can be later on cryopreserved live. We have a protocol for uh, isolation of nuclei, both in bulk and all, also single nuclei from frozen tissues as well as fresh, fresh tissues. We can provide cryopreservation and storage of primary cell lines as well as established cell line, uh, as well as isolation of DNA and mRNA and protocols for preparation of metabase chromosomes. We offer molecular cytogenetic analysis as a service. Those go from standard G-bending to fluorescent in situ hybridization, both with use of local-specific probes, as well as chromosome painting probe, even combined. We uh, provide access to spectral karyotyping, both for the analysis of the human and the mouse genome. We can also provide, uh, provide custom-designed probes for region of interest to the users. And more recently, we have incorporated the use of uh, mRNA in situ analysis, which more recently were also combined with the analysis of DNA copy number changes in the same single cells. Recently, we have also uh, started to provide uh, next generation sequencing assays and mainly there are two types of services that we provide. One is targeted sequencing um, with either panels of your choice or we have available a small panel of 156 cancer gene for the identification and detection of mutations. And we also provide uh, ultra-low coverage whole genome sequencing at a single cell level for the analysis of aneuploidy and copy number variation. The uh, staff in the core is a very diverse group of people. Um, there is a, a core uh, operation directors, uh, a very talented uh, woman, her name is Gidon, and there are four technicians that normally in their everyday life uh, provide access to the services that I just described, but uh, like everybody else, we have been affected by COVID, so the core was actually diverted to produce viral transportation media for the entire New York City, so everybody put our uh, flourishing insight hybridization experiments on hold for a while to, to generate uh, media for, for the city, and we really hope, like everybody else, to go back to our everyday life soon so that we can resume our uh, more fun activities. What I would like to discuss today is um, a series of experiments we have done over the course of, of, of several years to study the mechanism and consequences of aneuploid in tissue degeneration and aging. As many of you may know, aneuploid is classically a cancer phenotype. And as beautifully depicted by this image, this is a spectral uh, karyotyping hybridization 
uh, I performed when I was a postdoc in Tom Masrid Laboratory in NCI, you can uh, clearly appreciate on the right side that the uh, chromosomes of the cancer genome are affected by uh, both numerical and structural alteration that uh, affect pretty much each single chromosome uh, in, in a cell compared to uh, normal chrom normal looking chromosome on the left side, those are actually my chromosomes. And uh, if we look at um, aneuploidy and copy number alterations in the cancer genome in one of the most well-known uh, uh, aneuploid uh, databases for, for, for cancer genome, the Mitterman database, that nowadays contains more than 65,000 cases, we can appreciate that uh, the number of unemployed chromosomes, which is plotted here in blue, is, is extremely high and on ever, in average has uh, 1.8 unemployed chromosomes per case. And if we look at the distribution of aneuploidy per chromosome on the right side, we can clearly see that every, no, no, no single chromosome is paired. Every single chromosome is affected with, of course, some tissue having more uh, chromosome-specific aneuploidy than others, but on average, uh, uh, even though the frequency may vary, every chromosome is affected with both copy number gains and losses. But I would like to point your attention to the observation that aneuploidy is not simply or just a cancer phenotype. Um, there are evidence of aneuploidy and polyploidy in non-tumor mammalian cells. In, in mammals, germline polyploidy is incompatible with life, but there are clear examples of germline aneuploidy uh, most notoriously trisomic for chromosome 13, 18, and 21, which in humans are the only three uh, aneuploidy compatible with life, even though they occur at extremely low frequency and they cause uh, uh, problems. They, you know, these individuals have defects. Um, they are still compatible with life. And uh, aneuploidies are also observed from a variety, with a variety combination for sex chromosomes for the X and the Y chromosomes. There are also reports of somatic uh, mosaic polyploidy. Some tissues are very well known to contain polyploid cells, so for example, cardiomyocytes in the heart and hepatocytes in the liver. But polyploidy has also been reported in a variety of other tissues, like keratinocytes from, from the skin, megakaryocytes in the blood, and trophoblast giant cells in the placenta, as well as Purkinje brain cells. And this is a growing list of, of uh, polyploid cells reported in tissues, and there may be other that can be found as people investigate these cell types more in detail. There are also reports of somatic mosaic, mosaic aneuploidies that have been reported in epithelial cells from buccal swabs, in hepatocytes, in the liver, lymphocytes, in neurons in the brain, in all sites, and again, this is a growing list with other tissues added to the list um, of, of, of aneuploid cells. Um, the knowledge that aneuploidy is a feature of aging is actually uh, uh, obviously not new, and the strongest evidence that link aneuploidy to aging is the notion that uh, the rate of, of port with trisomic uh, 21, 18, and 13 is linked to the age of the mother. Um, women that have that are older than 35 years of age have a significant uh, increased risk to have uh, to to have um, children that carry trisomic 21, 18, or 13. This is very much likely correlated to the uh, increase of aneuploid in human oocytes, which is also associated with aging, with the percentage of aneuploid oocyte increasing with the age of the mother. And several years ago, we, um, we made an observation that uh, by mining publicly available data sets of gene expression changes in, uh, um, in all sites and in other tissue, we observed that the expression of a variety of components of genes of the mitotic machinery that control the, the correct uh, maintenance of the correct chromosome number in daughter cells are actually down-regulated during aging. So as you can see here, SMC1, BAB1, and BAB1B, they are both significantly down-regulated in oocyte of older women. This is true also in the brain, where um, other proteins of the spindle of, of the mitotic uh, machinery are down-regulated during aging. 
and there is uh, uh, several publications, some of which are from us and some are from uh, other uh, of our uh, colleagues that report the uh, incidence of aneuploidy during aging, again, uh, in the liver, uh, as been described by us and um, by Dr. Grompe, uh, there's um, reports of uh, increased aneuploidy in blood, blood lymphocytes and uh, in the buccal ep epithelium by a variety of investigators. Um, and the, uh, interestingly, the aneuploidy in the buccal epithelium has been linked also to Alzheimer's disease um, in these individuals. I would like to take a minute to, um, to discuss with you the difference between aneuploidy and chromosomal instability, because these two terms are not always very well defined and are often used interchangeably, but there is a, a pretty significant difference between aneuploidy and chromosomal instability. So aneuploidy, as you can uh, see here, is um, definition of cells that do not have a ploidy, that do not have a correct ploidy. And aneuploidy can be a stable situation where, for example, in trisomic 21 individuals, you have gain of chromosome 21 in each one of the cells, but the cells are all identical. They are all trisomic 21 and they are all aneuploidy. It's very sim different from a situation of chromosomal instability where you, ha you s always have aneuploid cells. You can have gain and losses of different chromosomes, but many of the cells are different from each other and they are in a state of instability. So generally, chromosomal instability is defined as a cellular state with a high propensity for copy, copy number misegregation. So we will, uh, uh, more often than not today, refer to aneuploidy as a chromosomal instability and uh, a state of, of, of uh, global cows in the tissue where different cells may have different uh, copy number changes. And there are intrinsic difficulties uh, associated with the analysis of chromosomal instability in non-tumor tissue. So what I would like to discuss today is the aneuploidy in, in aging as we have been introduced thus far. First of all, somatic aneuploidy in disease-free tissues, and for disease-free tissues I refer to uh, non-cancer tissues or tissues that are not clearly uh, um, uh, defined by a disease state, like for during aging for example. Um, aneuploid cells in this state are extremely rare event and usually uh, do not occur in clusters. Those are random cells within the tissues that could present aneuploidy. And unlike tumor cells in which many chromosomes are usually affected in the same single cell, somatic aneuploidy in disease-free tissue normally affects only one or few chromosomes, so that's much more difficult to study than not cancer cells. And therefore, the analysis of these cells require very specific um, uh, points of, 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 of applications. First of all, we need to have methods that increase the probes sensitivity so that we can distinguish those low-frequency cells from the general background that is, uh, um, is present in this type of experiment. There is also always an error rate. Then we, we need robust and unbiased analytical methods that allow us to analyze a large number of cells, for example, automatic scanning of the entire slides or automatic fish spot counting because we need to analyze a very large number of cells. And we also need uh, analytical methods after we have acquired all of our spot counting uh, data so that we can analyze these cells in, in a very um, controlled way and we can compare groups and we can um, uh, apply the correct statistics for the analysis of this type of data. So what I will discuss today with you is how we have approached number one and number two, and ASI is obviously a master in providing tools for, for addressing and help with point number two. Um, so here is what the, the approach that we have developed to uh, try to increase our sensitivity. So as many of you may be aware of, normally when we are interested in, in a locus on the chromosomal region, we have one probe or one color that stains the region we are interested in, and we may have other probes in other chromosomes, or we may have a probe for controlling the ploidy, or we may have a centromeric probe to control the ploidy for that specific chromosome. 
what we have done here instead, we have chosen two chromosomes of interest. For here, for example, we are interested in chromosome 9 and chromosome 12. And we have labeled these chromosomes with two probes for each single one of the chromosomes. When possible, we try to design the probe distal um, on the P-arm and on the Q-arm. For example, for chromosome 9, we have designed a custom probe in green, on a distal on the Q-arm and a chromosome and a probe in yellow on, on the, uh, on the uh, Q-arm. And likewise, for chromosome 12, we have two different probes one on the P arm in red and one on the Q arm in blue. And by doing so, uh, when we do analysis on interface cells, we can count our chromosomal gains only when both signals uh, for the same chromosome are gained. For example, only when there is a gain of both the, the signal in green and the signal in yellow for chromosome 9. And also when both signals are lost, if we are counting for chromosomal copy number losses. In this way, we greatly re reduce the number of false positive and false negative, and we also increase our confidence that the entire chromosome is gained instead of having focal copy number alterations of only a specific area of the chromosome. We are very well aware that by doing so, we limit our ability to uh, study a large number of chromosomes. This is due to the number of fluorophores that can be applied in the same cells. And also, we limit our analysis to entire chromosome copy number gains. We do see in, in many instances that, you know, maybe it's only one probe is gain or loss, but at that point we cannot distinguish this event from technical artifacts. So, um, we, uh, we have decided for, for the time being to consider only both copy number, uh, both gain and loss of the same probes. Um, we also developed specific analytical tool in collaboration with Jessica Barr when she was here at Einstein that will allow you to uh, import this kind of data and we will see some example later on during the presentation where um, I can show you how we have uh, imported copy number changes and apply these uh, um, these tools to the analysis of the data. There is a web-based application called Anuvi, which is free for everybody and can be found in this um, paper listed here, point number four, and everybody can access it and can go in with, you can go in with your own data and try to, to play with it and, and, and apply statistical analysis to your data sets. So this project started several years ago uh, when we became interested in copy number changes during aging. And the first experiment we do was, was we did was actually directed to study copy number changes in the aging brain. The reason why we choose the brain is because there were uh, observations that the brain could be a tissue that uh, um, could be su su subjected to copy number changes during aging. And we have decided to do these experiments in, in the mouse first for obvious reason of accessibility uh, to tissues. So just for comparison, um, we have taken mice at three, three different age group, uh, young adult mice at four months of age, middle age at 15 months, and older mice at 28 months. So older mice at 28 months correspond about to 81 years of age in humans. And we have decided to begin our analysis by comparing the cortex and the cerebellum. And by applying flourishing insight hybridization in single cells, as I just described to you, we actually have detected a significant increase of aneuploid cells in the old uh, cortex, but not in the cerebellum. So in the old cerebral cortex, we have observed uh, increase of aneuploidy, both as a chromosomal gain and losses, but such um, aneuploidy was not detected in the old mouse, which suggests a tissue specificity of accumulation of aneuploidy during aging, at least in the mouse. And the first question that we asked was whether um, the cells that were affected were neuronal or non-neuronal cells, so whether both the cell type during aging could be affected with the same uh, rate. So we use a fax approach to isolate nuclei uh, from the neurons by staining with the anti neon staining, which stains the nuclei or neuronal cells, and separated the, uh, the nuclei into new and positive and new and negative fraction. And then we apply interface fish, 
with uh, one of the chromosomes that normally didn't go copy, undergo copy number changes, chromosome 1 and 1 that was more severely affected, which is chromosome 18 for the mouse. And what we saw is that there was a uh, higher level of, uh, significantly higher level of aneuploid cells in the non-neuronal fraction. And we also confirmed our previous observation that the aneuploid was chromosomal specific. So from these experiments, we learned that aging is associated is associated with the copy number uh, aneuploidy, uh, at least in the mouse brain, and that such aneuploidy seems to be in the brain uh, area specific, with the cortex being more severely affected, and also uh, uh, cell type specific and chromosome specific, with non-neuronal cell, non -neuronal cells more affected than non-neurons, as well as with some chromosomes affected more than others. You can go in the publication and, and look up the other chromosomes that we analyze and a much more extensive type of analysis than we have done than not what I have the chances to discuss with you today. When we, um, when we first um, uh, gather those information, we start thinking about what is the uh, functional consequences on aneuploid. Why do aneuploid cells accumulate with age? And also, what is the consequence? What happens to tissues when um, aneuploid is acquired? And, and both in terms of aneuploid and polyploid. Um, so there, there is a variety of, of alterations that occur uh, to cells when they are unemployed. And this has been widely reported in the literature at, at this point that uh, uh, chromosomally unstable cells, they uh, for the most part are less proliferation if we are in a uh, non-transformed phenotype. So we are talking about cell, cells that are uh, otherwise wild type, that they carry wild type P53 and wild type uh, uh, checkpoint controls. They undergo metabolic alterations, they have increased prototoxicity, and they also have increased genomic instability. And all these consequences are, have been clearly linked to a variety of, of phenotypes, from cancer to miscarriages that we have seen, to neurological and neurogenitive disease, to aging, and to uh, aneuploid syndromes. And all those uh, effects that I have described thus far are mainly detrimental. They cause uh, uh, detrimental effect. They are not good for the cells or for the organism in general. But there are also some reports that would actually suggest that in some specific cases or in some instances, aneuploidy may be beneficial. For example, there is evidence, for example, during the developing brain, that aneuploidy may provide genetic diversity and be important for diversification of the neurons. It has also been reported that aneuploidy may better help uh, um, um, overcome a situation of high stress. So we became intrigued into this uh, wide variety of potential uh, outcome, and we wanted to design experiments to look into these details a little bit more carefully and in more depth. So we originally decided to set up a very simple experiment in which we took primary fibroblast, the com common IMR90 human primary lung fibroblast that a lot of people are using, and these cells are known to undergo replicative senescence in culture, if you culture them for a very long time. Um, and we simply ask the questions, what happens to the genome of these uh, cells during replicative senescence? Yeah, by applying the fluorescent in situ hybridization uh, techniques, the IFISH that I described earlier to you, uh, analyzing chromosome 9 and 12 in the human, and in a very similar experiment with mouse cells, analyzing chromosome 1 and chromosome 18, what we have observed is that replicative senescence is associated with a progressive accumulation of non-deployed non cells um, in culture, both in the human and in the mouse. And the accumulation of unemployed cells was associated, associated with downregulation of components of the mitotic machinery, as I described you before, uh, namely BAB1, BAB1B, SMC1, and BAB3. 
And these were specific senescent cells because quiescent cells that were simply arrested from uh, entering the cell cycle did not have downregulation of these uh, components of the mitotic machinery. And uh, as we will see later, they, they did also not accumulate unemployed. So this is a very specific effect of, of replicative senescence. And uh, we became interested in uh, BAB1 and BAB1B and SMC1 for a variety of reasons, but mainly because uh, there is a very, very elegant paper by uh, Darren Baker and Jan Bardorser uh, several years ago that demonstrates that insufficiency of bab one causes early onset age-associated phenotypes. And several years ago, we have demonstrated that both inhibition of BAB1 causes genomic instability and also uh, down regulation of SMC1 causes uh, high level, uh, uh, levels of aneuploidy and variety of phenotypes. So we wanted to ask the reverse questions. If we take human primary IMR90 lung fibroblast and we induce aneuploidy in these cells by means of down regulation of BAB1 or SMC1, what is the fate of these cells? Well, the simple uh, uh, answer is that we impair proliferation, and this was obviously expected. Uh, so we decided to uh, choose two different SHRNA targeting uh, BAB1, named here B1 and B2, as well as two different SHRNA targeting SMC1, named here S1 and S2, and compare the proliferation level of cells affected uh, treated by SHRNA um, exposure compared to replicative senescent cells over the course of 13 days. And uh, we observe a significant impairment of cell growth in all those conditions. And the next question we wanted to ask was, of course, did we generate an aneuploidy? And again, this was expected, so we apply our favorite interface fish analysis with probes for chromosome 9 and chromosome 12, and we analyze the aneuploid levels in, um, in the culture. And what we observe is that both SMC1 and BAB1 have a significant accumulation of aneuploid cells. The aneuploid cells that are generated under this experimental condition uh, vary in frequency from a lo relatively low level of 20% in BAB1 to a much higher level of up to 50% of the cells in one of the um, uh, SHRNA against SMC2. And we also observe that the level of aneuploidy is quite complex. We have aneuploidy for one single chromosome, but we also have aneuploidy on a tetraploid or a triploid or a uh, loss of copy number changes of one chromosome. But we also have very severe level of aneuploidies with aneuploidies that are present in cells that have more than five copies of the genome, as is, as is for example, depicted in the cells that you are seeing here. This is a very wide range of, of copy number alterations with uh, level and mild aneuploidy and a really high level of aneuploidy. What we were perhaps more most surprised to observe was that you know the um, outcome of uh, decreased proliferation and aneuploidy was actually uh, induction of senescence. So what you are seeing here is a beta gal staining of cells, um, control cells on the top left, and then we have in the middle uh, two different uh, cultures of cells uh, treated with SHRNA against BAB1. Um, BAB1, BAB1 1 and B2 on the bottom, and we also have uh, two different SHRNA targeting SMC1 on the far right, on the top and on the bottom. And those uh, cells are uh, depicted here in comparison to senescent cells on the bottom left. So as you can see, um, uh, beta gal staining of this culture is almost undistinguishable, and we have severe, severely uh, affected cells in each one of those experimental conditions. But as many of you may know, um, a beta gal staining is not perhaps not the best marker for the analysis of senescent cells. Uh, so we also went in and applied a variety of different markers to characterize these cells, which again are very, uh, you know, are described in much better details in, in our publication that you can see listed here on the bottom. But basically, we see that 
as depicted here for BAB1, um, you can see that uh, induction, uh, down regulation of BAB1 significantly increase uh, senescent cells by staining with SA beta gal. By analysis with morphology, senescent cells are known to be uh, enlarged and have a flattened morphology. Um, uh, so they, the, the cells are beta gal positive, but they also um, uh, they also um, have senescent features, and they also overexpress P16 and P21, the classical markers of cellular senescence. Um, the point to keep in mind here is that, um, as you can see, compared in the plottings on the left to senescence, to replicative senescence cells, which are depicted in, in black, um, many of the differences are undistinguishable. The differences of replicative senescence in that, in, um, levels to those that have been generated by induced aneuploidy are not significantly different, meaning that cells that are uh, induced to become aneuploid acquire very similar features relative to replicative senescent cells, but only in 13 days because this culture has been kept uh, and analyzed after 13 days from deregulation of BAB1 or SMC1. So we concluded that induction of aneuploidy, at least by SMC1 or BAB1, is sufficient to, include, to, to cause aneuploidy and uh, the fate of these cells is uh, senescence. So what are senescent cells? I'm by any means an expert in senescent cells, but senescent cells are cells that are uh, permanently, permanent, permanently arrested from proliferating and um, they have a very uh, um, unique characteristics, which is the secretion of factors that are, uh, un that are no m better known as the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SASP, whereby they secrete chemokine, uh, cytokines, growth factor, and proteases that alter the uh, microenvironment and uh, their secretion can be both P53 dependent or P53 independent and again just like uh, aneuploidy they can have uh, beneficial or detrimental consequences they can destroy tissue they can destroy uh, destroy normal cell function they can prevent stem cell function they can promote cancer and promote degenerations but they also have some uh, positive um, uh, phenotypes uh, so, of course, we wanted to know if uh, our cells um, induced by aneuploidy also uh, trigger the, the release of chemokine and cytokine known as the SASP. So, what we, what we, have, what we did, we um, conditioned the media of aneuploid cells and we did analysis on 48 uh, cytokines and chemokines that were released by our aneuploid-induced senescent cells and we measure their levels compared to uh, replicative senescent cells. And as you can see here, uh, the classical uh, secreted markers of senescent cells were also upregulated in our uh, aneuploidy-induced senescent cells, uh, producing a secretory phenotype which overlap uh, to some extent with those described for other types of senescent cells. These data have been PCR validated, uh, at least a subset of that, and um, we are now pursuing this and try to better characterize which kind of factor are secreted by aneuploid cells. So if we go back to our, uh, um, our cell fate and what is the consequences of chromosomal instability in non-tumor tissues, uh, we start thinking that maybe the detrimental and the beneficial ex effects of, of this um, uh, outcome of aneuploidy is not so clear-cut and uh, uh, there may be cases where cells may, um, may respond to aneuploidy um, thinking that they uh, may have a benefit but uh, at the, on, on the long run um, this outcome may become detrimental. So in a sense what I'm trying to say that there may be instances where cells are a little bit confused and they do not know whether you know a specific consequence is detrimental or beneficial at least at the beginning. So we wanted to look into this a little bit better. Um, so we knew that 
um, aneuploidy is sufficient to trigger senescence and by definition aneuploidy induced senescence cause aneuploid cells. So we know that aneuploidy causes aneuploidy, that aneuploidy causes senescence, and the senescence, senescence aneuploid cells secrete a variety of factors, which we define here as the aneuploidy secretome. But what about all the other known triggers of senescence? There's a uh, wide array of, of treatments that can cause senescence, um, summarized here in terms of genotoxic stress, oncogene induction, P16, P21 upregulation or deregulation of mitochondrial dysfunction, which all cause senescence, um, induce senescence, which all cause a variety of secretomes. Um, but what about their aneuploidy? If, if aneuploidy is so, so linked to, to senescence and it can be considered as a uh, response, then all these cells should be aneuploid, but are they or not? So we set up a um, quite massive experiment where we, um, we choose a large array of uh, senescence inducers. So those are very well characterized and they're known to induce senescence in a variety of cell types. And we categorize them as a physiological stressor, chemotherapy-related stressor, genetic perturbation, and mitochondrial dysfunction. And we, for each one of those classes, we selected different, um, different inducers. For example, for physio physiological stress, we um, consider replicative senescence as exposure and also exposure to glucose ribose. For chemotherapy, we expose the cells to bleomycin and taxol. And for genetic perturbation, we use our BAB1 SMC1 model, but we also use upregulation of P16 because it's known to induce senescence cells. And for mitochondrial dysfunction, we expose the cells to paraquat, to rotenol, or to rho zero. And we ask the question, are those cells aneuploid or not? And what are the level of aneuploidy? So we combine it, we, we apply again our favorite interface fish, fish assay for chromosome 9 and for chromosome 12. And then we set the microscope and we analyzed a lot of cells. Uh, for a lot of cells, I'm talking about more than 40,000 cells to uh, gather a lot of information about the aneuploidy levels in these cells. So the uh, bird eye view is, are senescent cells aneuploid or not? And the short answer is yes. Uh, if we compare aneuploidy level for chromosome 9, 17, and 12, we eventually at some point expanded our chromosomal array analysis into some other chromosomes. We see that senescent cells depicted here in red are significantly more aneuploid than proliferative cells. And when we look at the distribution of copy number changes across different types of treatment are also relative to diploidy, tetraploidy, or other ploidy states, we see that the difference is not driven by a specific treatment, but even though there are different uh, profiles of, of aneuploidy, every single one of the conditions that we have analyzed causes aneuploidy. So the short answer is yes. We believe that all senescent cells are aneuploid. And this is depicted also here when we correlate the level of non-deployed non non cells, basically our aneuploid cells, to uh, beta galastaining, we see that you know when there is a significant accumulation of aneuploidy, there is also a significant accumulation of uh, beta gal positive cells. And when we do the correlation between um, uh, aneuploid cells and beta gal positive cells, there is a significant correlation between those two factors. But as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we 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 were we we were we believe that you know if we had better tools to analyze this data we could probably uh, gather much more details information than not just a simple aneuploidy level so we team up with uh, Jessica Marr and uh, which is um, she has a position here at Einstein in system biology to try to come up with a clever way to analyze this data and basically she came up with these matrices that could be used to analyze the data where we basically plot copy number for one chromosome on one ax and copy number for the other chromosome on the other ax and then we, we, we generate a square where we report the frequency of cells that have 
gain or loss of each one of these single chromosomes. And those could be anchored around the diploid state, the tetraploid state, or the octoploid state. And um, this tool, as I, say, as I mentioned earlier, is publicly available. You can go and read about the publication and use the tool for yourself. But when we apply this tool to each single one of these um, treatments, um, now we can start having patterns that we can compare between the young, the young cells, the uh, uh, physiological stressor, the uh, replicative senescence and the glucose and ribose, the uh, chemotherapy, which is depicted here in orange, and the BABA1, um, the SMC1, and the P16 overexpression, as well as the mitochondrial dysfunction. And this visual display can actually be summarized into, um, into better visualization and data once the statistical comparison among these groups are performed, which is, looks something like this. So you can see, as you can see here, um, uh, the level of aneuploidy uh, by unsupervised uh, hierarchical clustering can group the uh, cells into mild aneuploid, moderate aneuploid, and severe aneuploid. And uh, uh, when we look at the stressor that have been used to generate these uh, senescence aneuploid cells, we can clearly see that the um, level of aneuploidy that is generated by um, the stressor is not random, but uh, genetic dysfunction causes very similar outcome uh, which is very different than mitochondrial dysfunction. The three mitochondrial dysfunction stressors that we use, para, quad, rotenone, and rho, they all induce a, a much more severe and much higher level of chromosomal instability than not the physiological stressor, the replicative senescence and the glucoribose. So it appears that the stressor that is, co that is, that is used to, to induce senescence uh, is reflected at the chromosomal level by severity of chromosomal instability. And if we look into the data a little bit better by another uh, type of plotting, we can um, generate an aneuploidy score for those cells and also heterogeneity score. So an aneuploidy score is how severe the aneuploid level is and heterogeneity, heterogeneity score is the reflection of chromosomal instability, how many different states we have into a population of cells. And we were very surprised, basically, to see that the stressor that causes the highest level of, of uh, aneuploidy score, as well as the highest level of uh, heterogeneity score, is um, uh, exposure to high levels of sugar, which seems to be uh, really the worst uh, exposure you can possibly um, provide to the cells. So we wanted to look into this uh, a little bit better. So the first thing we did is to just expose our uh, normal IMR90 cells to glucose and ribose in culture at a, a different concentration. We started at 5 millimolar, which is a relatively low concentration, to 25 millimolar, which corresponds to uh, diabetic levels. It's still in physiological conditions, but it's quite high. And we follow proliferation of the cells over the course of six days by monitoring them every two hours. And you can see here that there is a significant uh, um, uh, reduction of growth, uh, which is dependent on the level of sugars. So we follow the same pattern. Cells are stressed when they're present in, in uh, presence of, of sugar, and they uh, reduce their proliferation. If we compare the data in another way, where we plot uh, the number of cells for each time points, and we do a statistical comparison of these groups, we see that um, a concentration as low as 10 millimolar sugar is already sufficient to cause a uh, significant reduction in proliferation, at least under these uh, experimental conditions. And um, so we wanted to know what is the outcome. Uh, I, mean, I kind of already told you, but um, if we take young proliferating cells, we expose them to glucose ribose for 15 millimolar for 10 days, and uh, we let them grow for, 50, for 10 days, and we absorb the phenotype of the cells. We see that the cells are genomically unstable. They have a significant accumulation of micronuclei. They become binucleated. They stop proliferating, uh, also demonstrated here by incorp uh, reduced incorporation of BRDU, and they become uh, senescence as measured by 
um, uh, acquisition of SA beta gal staining and their uh, representative images are shown here on the bottom. They also obviously uh, become unemployed. Um, we uh, have done interface fish analysis at uh, 10 millimolar, 15 millimolar and 20 millimolar uh, compared to replicative senescent cells. And again here you can see especially in the 20 millimolar uh, the level of aneuploidy is quite high and is also complex and it seems to be much more severe than what we observe during the replicative senescence. And again, the treatments in these conditions are all for 10 days. So here is a different uh, plotting of the data, a 15 millimolar, where we see again for a large number of cells that there is accumulation of aneuploidy. Uh, as a consequence of uh, exposure to sugar. But is, is it this a, a tissue culture uh, observation or is it actually this is true also in vivo? So what we did, we uh, obtained a peripheral blood mononuclear cells from uh, individuals uh, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and we have performed uh, interface fish analysis for chromosome 9 and chromosome 12 for uh, healthy and diabetic uh, patients and we see that there is a significant accumulation of unemployed PBMCs also in the peripheral blood of diabetic patients. So what we observe in culture seems to be maintained in, uh, in, uh, in vivo in humans. And we also have done uh, another uh, experiment where we have analyzed solid tissues uh, from a mouse. Um, here you can see in the light uh, red we have analyzed uh, tissue sections from a murine pancreas. It's a mouse model of diabetes. It's a DBDB mouse model which is very well characterized uh, mouse model of diabetes. And we also saw accumulation of non-deployed cells in solid tissues. We have now data on the uh, acquire on the brain of diabetic patient which we also see that there is a significant increase of aneuploid cells in the brain of individuals diagnosed with diabetes. Um, but all the data that I've shown you right now are uh, based on uh, flourishing in situ of realization and I hope that by now I convinced you that this is a very powerful technology, uh, especially if you can combine with uh, uh, details and sophisticated uh, methods to analyze a lot of cells and compare uh, the biological significance of the differences you may measure. So the major advantage of FISH is that it's highly sensitive, especially if you combine multiple probes for the same chromosomes, and in our hands has a very low error rate. We believe that our error rate is estimated to be less than 0.5%. You can collect data on large number of cells, especially if you are lucky enough to have an automatic uh, microscope that does a slide scanning and helps you with the spot counting of these very large number of cells. But it has also these advantages. It is uh, labor intensive and time consuming, especially if you uh, want to review uh, carefully uh, the spot counting quantification and if you want to analyze really large number of cells, in a sense, as you have to do uh, for um, uh, random low frequency events. And it is very limited in the number of chromosomes you can analyze. Uh, our data have been collected on two chromosomes and you know, we are of course aware you can analyze more than two chromosomes at once, but it becomes complicated in terms of fluorophore and the yeah, effort you have to uh, really uh, apply to, to these cells to analyze more, more than two chromosomes in single cells. So many of you, and we were also intrigued in, um, in uh, trying uh, single cell methods for uh, whole genome analysis, and we have tried a var variety of methods, but what I'm showing you to you today is a 10x genomics assay uh, simply because this is very uh, widely uh, applied by a variety of people and it's uh, very very powerful and it can analyze can allow you to analyze a large number of cells and I'm not going into the details of how the assay works uh, there's the website from 10x genomics is very well done um, but we have applied the 10x genomic copy number assays which came out, came out about a year and a half ago, I would say, to the analysis of our IMR90 cells and our replicative senescent cells because those were very well characterized in our hands. Uh, 
And so we took uh, cells from our young proliferating cells and we uh, analyzed um, replicative senescent cells. So we have data on uh, 411 young cells and 248 replicative senescent cells. And uh, I just would like to, you know, warn anybody that is interested in this type of assays that the sensitivity of fish and the sensitivity that you can gather for uh, single cells, ultra low coverage sequencing is very, very different. And even though you have the undoubted uh, advantage of analyzing the entire genome, which is extremely powerful, the sensitivity of detecting copy number changes because you are surveying a, a limited amount of the genome is not as high as interface fish. So we have, uh, we actually have made this comparison which was published um, about a year ago where we compare the data that we obtain by interface fish on these cells by using the um, tools that I described here today with uh, single cell, uh, ultra low coverage single cell data to, cop to detect copy number changes using uh, 10x genomics or uh, other single cell approaches and we describe the advantages or disadvantages in both. So um, uh, we firmly believe that, you know, to have a complete picture, so copy number changes, you probably need uh, both 10x genomics or single cell, ultra low coverage single cell sequencing combined to iFish data because the type of information you gather from these assays is very, very different. And we said, um, I have uh, been very lucky and I am very lucky to have a large group of uh, collaborators both here at Einstein and outside and I have very dedicated people in my laboratory that have really performed an outstanding job in the analysis of uh, single cells using fish and other methodologies and uh, uh, my collaborator uh, Dr. Sant'Ambrogio at Cornell University that uh, spearheaded the uh, diabetes uh, angle of this project. Uh, my collaborators here at Einstein, Dr. Biju, which is an expert in single cell genomics and help, has helped us moving into uh, next generation sequencing on single cells, uh, Jessica Marr, who has been an outstanding collaborator to develop the tools that we now normally use to analyze um, single cells, uh, my collaborators in the clinical arena, as well as my collaborators all over the world. Uh, Dr. Bezzoni, my former mentor, uh, which uh, we have done a lot of work on the liver, which I had no chances to discuss with you today. My collaborator, Dr. Gadina, they help us with the analysis of the SASP. Uh, Judy Campisi, a uh, world-known uh, expert in cellular senescence. And all the other cores here at Einstein, they just like mine, help us uh, with the data, the genomic score and the histopathology score in particular, as well as the outstanding work that Gidon is doing in our molecular cytogenetic score with all the technicians that are always happy to help, not just me, but everybody here at Einstein that wants to uh, venture into analysis of single cells by fish. And with this, I would like to uh, thank everybody for your patience and I look forward to hear your questions.